Welcome back to part two of four. One of those processes is natural selection. You've heard of natural selection. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that's evolution. Well, that's not true. It's natural selection is only one of the mechanisms by which evolution works and is not by itself evolution. Darwin tried to convince people that they were the same because he knew that if you could demonstrate natural selection is true, which it is, he thought it, by linking it with his idea, he could convince people of evolution. Citation needed. But they're actually the opposite. No, they're not. Natural selection is one of the mechanisms by which evolution works. They're opposites. Repetition does not make that statement true. Here's how it works. With natural selection, suppose you have two dogs, okay? And uh, suppose that they fall in love and get married and, uh, and they have uh, offspring, okay? And suppose those dogs have a gene for short hair and a gene for long hair. And suppose those genes have a combined effect, so you have dogs with medium length hair. Okay, and, and again, this is simplified, but the basic genetic principles here are true. And so those dogs, um, when they have offspring, some of the dogs will get the short gene from mom and the short gene from dad, and they'll end up with very short fur. Okay, and then some will get the short gene from one parent, the long gene from another, and they'll end up with medium length hair just like their parents. In fact, that would be the most likely combination. 50% of the offspring statistically would end up with that particular combination. And then some of the dogs would get the long gene from dad and the long gene from mom, and they'd end up with very long fur. And so right here you see, in one generation, a tremendous amount of variation within a kind. Now, now there's no evolution yet, because we started with dogs, we ended up with dogs. Have we gained any new information? No, we started with information for short and long fur, and, by, and that's what you end up with, right? It's just expressed differently. Now suppose there's an ice age, suppose it gets very cold. Well, what's going to happen? Well, the dogs that have the longer fur, they're going to do fine. They're well insulated against that cold. The dogs with the shorter fur, not so much. <laughs> they're not so comfortable. And so, sadly, they die. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say natural selection was nice. I just said it was true. It's not nice. Well, now, the dogs that have the longer fur, then, are going to find other dogs that have longer fur, right? and they're going to uh, reproduce. Now the dogs that have the shorter and medium length fur are not going to reproduce because they're dead, and dead things don't reproduce so well. So, the, But the only ones that survive then are the ones that have the longer fur, right? And so when they have offspring, what kind of uh, offspring are they going to have? They're going to have, well, dogs with longer fur, right? Because you see, the information for the short fur has been lost from the genome of the dogs, at least in that part of the world. And so are these dogs ever going to have short or medium length hair? No, it's gone. That information's gone. So is this evolution? Yes, there has been an overall change to the genome of a population. No, because we haven't gained any new instructions, have we? In fact, we've actually lost some information. We've lost the information for short hair. How is that not evolution? The only way it can be is if you're actually using a straw man right now and redefining what evolution is. That's gone. It's a great example of natural selection. Right? It's a great example of survival of the fittest, but it's a very poor example of evolution because we've started with dogs, we've ended up with dogs, and we've not increased the information. We've actually lost some information. Okay. Biology Online defines evolution as the change in genetic composition of a population over successive generations. How does your example not fit that? Putting it another way, if there was a heat wave, would the dogs ever go back to having short or medium length fur? No, because that information is gone they would just go extinct. That would be the end of it. Unless there were dogs from other parts of the world that still had that, that um, short, the information for short hair. Now, if we started the experiment over, and so you got all three varieties again, and this time, let's make the temperature get very hot. Okay, now what's gonna happen? Well, now the dogs that have the longer fur, they don't do so well, but the one has the, has the shorter fur, he survives, right? And so, and so he goes on and and now what's he going to reproduce with? He's, well, he's going to go on and produce uh, dogs that have the shorter length fur, right? And of course, that's what we find. And so, again, this is a great example of natural selection. It's a great example of survival of the fittest, of adaptation, right? Because the environment got warm, and we say the dogs adapted. Not that any individual adapted. It's just the ones that weren't already suited to that environment died. You're describing evolution perfectly again. So how is this not evolution? And so the... Uh, but the information has decreased because we started with information for short and long, now we only have information for short. Which fits perfectly in the evolutionary model. And so this is not evolution, it's in the opposite direction of evolution. 
How can evolution be the opposite of itself? You're not making a whole lot of sense here. And of course, this is how we account for different dogs in the wild. Lo and behold, dogs start out with lots of heterozygous uh, combinations, and those that end up in the cold environments tend to have the longer fur genes, because if they didn't, they'd die, and those that end up in the hotter environments have the shorter fur genes, because if they didn't, they'd die. And uh, so we can account for the different uh, wild dogs that we find in the world. So how many dogs would you need on Noah's Ark? Just two. Yeah, just two, because you can get all those different traits later. You can get the different variety afterwards. And so they get off Noah's Ark, and they spread out from the mountains of Ararat, where the Noah's Ark landed, and they carry certain traits with them. And if those traits are not conducive to survival in that particular environment, then the dogs with those traits die and do not pass them on to their offspring. And so lo and behold, we find that dogs in colder climates tend to have longer, thicker fur. Dogs in the hotter climates tend to have the shorter, thinner fur. It makes perfect sense. Well, the whole Noah flood story doesn't really make sense. But it's interesting that you have to contradict the Bible to try to make it make sense. Um, the dogs die if they don't have the right traits. And if the dog's smart, maybe it goes to the environment that uh, best suits it. That's another possibility as well, at least for dogs. And so this is how we account for the different uh, breeds of, uh, or the different species or different breeds of wild dogs. It's just an example of natural selection. Uh, and the built-in information that God has put in the dog kind. But my secular colleagues would say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, it's not just natural selection, it's natural selection and mutations. Yes, mutations are another mechanism by which evolution works, and as mentioned before, they can be good, bad, or benign, with bad ones being weeded out by natural selection. So we got to talk about mutations. A mutation basically is a mistake in the DNA. You can think of it like a typo in your DNA. It's a, it's a copying mistake. And suppose you have genes uh, in dogs for four normal legs, which all dogs should have that information. That's not variable. They should have, all dogs should have proper legs. But there's a mutation that causes some instructions to be garbled, and the dog's legs don't form quite properly. They still form, but they're, they're much shorter than they should be, and so you end up with a dog with short, stubby little legs. And that is a good example of a bad mutation. Now, if you think about it, a dog like that is not going to do very well in the wild, is he? Because he can't run very fast because on those short, stubby little legs, he can't catch anything. He's more likely to be caught by something himself, right? He's not going to do so well. And so we find that uh, to some extent in nature, mutations tend to be weeded out. No, we find the bad mutations get weeded out, as I previously mentioned. A cherry-picked example of a bad mutation is not representative of all mutations. Some mutations are immediately fatal and those are immediately eliminated. But some mutations just make it harder to survive, and, and organisms with those mutations tend to be eliminated, maybe not completely, depending on how severe the uh, mistake is. Again, we call those bad mutations. Bad mutations are not the only kind of mutations an organism can have. But some people like dogs with short, stubby little legs because they can't jump up on you as much, okay? And so people will find the mutations that they like in dogs and they will take dogs with short, stubby little legs and breed them with other dogs with short, stubby little legs and end up with lots of dogs with short, stubby little legs. Yes, this is called artificial selection, which is another mechanism by which evolution works. You see, one of the best survival strategies an animal can have is to be useful to humans, at which point it no longer matters if it can survive out in the wild, because humans will take care of it and direct its evolution to be more and more useful in some way to humans. In this case, as a companion. Right? And uh, so and the, do the dog doesn't have to care for itself because it's got a human caretaker. And so he doesn't have to go out and catch food or anything. And so he survives because human beings take care of him and spend millions of dollars at the vet trying to keep the poor thing alive because <laughs> he's missing some instructions. Because he's evolved the dependency on humans to take care of him. And, and that's why domestic breeds of dogs are full of mutations. They really are. All life forms on this planet are full of mutations. And just because an animal has a mutation that would be bad in one setting, doesn't mean that they are bad in all settings. So in an environment like a human home, a mutation that might be bad out in the wild can become a benefit if the human favors it. Because in the wild, those, they would just die. But because they have a human caretaker, they're okay. There are dogs that causes a, there are, there are mutations that causes a dog's snout not to form properly. A dog's supposed to have a long snout. There's a mutation that causes it to be short, and the, the lower jaw doesn't close quite right on it. And the skin is designed to fit the longer snout, so it hangs off the side, and it can get infected. And some people think that's cute. And I, I don't know if the dog really thinks about it that way, though. Maybe, you know. 
maybe not so much. <laughs> well, let's talk about poodles for a moment. <laughs> They're cute, but they really do have some problems because of mutations that have accumulated in their genome. Poodles will not survive in the wild. And they don't need to survive out in the wild because they have evolved to be dependent on and useful to humans. You would not find that because they have too many genetic uh, problems. Uh, one, of the, one of the mutations in a poodle, you see a dog's fur is supposed to grow so long and then it, it stops and falls out and is replaced and that regulates a dog's uh, fur growth. But with a poodle, their hair grows forever because there's a mutation that, that, that's, that gene is damaged that regulates the hair growth. And so with poodle, it just keeps growing and growing. And Yes, and this mutation makes them useful to humans that have allergies. And so they have evolved to fill this ecological niche that dogs without this mutation have problems in. You'd end up with a big poof ball if you didn't, you know, cut it from time to time. And so there's no way they could survive in the wild. Again, they don't need to because they have evolved to be useful to and dependent on humans. And of course, they can get into their, their hair can get in their eyes and their eyes can get infected and they go blind. It can get in their ears and it can cause all kinds of problems, can even kill them. And so, uh, again, you have to really take care of these creatures because they're missing some instructions. They've lost some information. Which, again, is evolution. But is this evolution? And I would say hardly. You would say that because you're making money off of ignorant people and it would hurt your wallet and possibly your feelings to say otherwise. Not at all, because, again, evolution's about increasing the information in DNA. Ah, there's our straw man. It's interesting how the only people who say that evolution is about the increase in information are creationists who want evolution to be wrong. Scientists, on the other hand, say that evolution is the change in genetic composition of a population over successive generations, which your poodle example fits perfectly. And the problem that poodles have is they're missing some instructions. They've lost information. Which is still evolution. And it causes them some, some rather uh, severe problems. Actually, in the ecological niche they have evolved to fill, the benefits greatly outweigh the detriments. Out in the wild is outside their ecological niche, and so they would then have problems just as any other organism outside of its ecological niche would. And so you see, this is how we account for the different breeds of domestic dogs. It's just the different variations of information that God put in the dog kind. Since you have changed your definition of kind, since you told us what a kind is, can you please explain to us how to determine what falls within the dog kind? And mutations, mistakes that have crept in that some people have liked, and they've concentrated those um, mutations into the various um, kinds of domestic dogs. So, wait, do these mutations make them no longer part of the dog kind then? Because they are changes that occurred in their genetics after God supposedly made them. But it's not evolution, is it? Because we haven't gained any brand new instructions. Not at all. In fact, we've lost information. Which, again, is part of evolution, and so they have evolved. We think the dogs on Noah's Ark would have been more like the wolf kind. Wait, 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 wait. So, the wolf kind is different from the dog kind? And if it was the wolf kind that was on the Ark, then how did we get the dog kind? Can animals change from one kind to another? If so, then can you please explain to us the mechanisms responsible for that? Because they have a lot of the heterozygous genome, lots of different potential for variation. But then as you selectively breed those down and you concentrate the mutations, uh, you get down to the poodle, and that's pretty much it. That's kind of the bottom of the line of, of the dog <laughs> kind, basically. Okay, so since your slide there is labeled dog kind, and it includes wolves, I'm going to assume that you misspoke earlier. Um, but you see, this isn't evolution, is it? Yes, it is. Because we haven't gained any new information. We've actually lost information, haven't we? We've lost uh, some instructions, and that's why the poodle has the problems that it does. Repeating yourself does not change the fact that that is evolution. Uh, when I'm doing this presentation for children, I'll sometimes say that... Uh, Information in DNA is kind of like jelly beans, okay? And so the wild kinds of dogs, lots of jelly beans, lots of information. And then through selectively breeding them and breeding them and so on, you get down to the poodle and you've got some problems on your hands. I wasn't sure where you were going with your comparison, but now that we have arrived at it, those two things are not alike at all. Sure, you can use jelly beans to help demonstrate natural selection, but not all of evolution. Even by your own admission from earlier, jelly beans that might represent poodles weren't even in the jar originally. Okay. This is 
He's got sort of just the bare minimum information necessary to keep him alive. I feel like we need two heaping scoops of citation needed. So here's something to think about then. Could I ever turn a dog into a cat by mutations in natural selection? No, and you can see why. Because mutations in natural selection are just removing jelly beans. Except for your continuation with the stupid jelly bean comparison, evolution states that you could never get a cat from a dog, which I also think I mentioned earlier. You can get something like a cat from a dog with enough selective breeding, but it will never be a cat. And a cat has different information in its, in its genome, and you can't turn jelly beans into Jolly Ranchers by simply removing jelly beans. If genetics are jelly beans, then what do Jolly Ranchers represent? You're making less sense as your presentation wears on. It's not going to work. Different information. Now again, some of the instructions are the same because we use some of the same chemistry. That's, that's un it's the same because there's a common ancestor. Understood. But uh, you can't change one basic kind of animal into another. Until you tell us what a kind even is, you can't really make a statement like that by removing information. It's not going to happen. So, does this mean there are ways of changing one kind of animal into another kind? Can you please define a kind for us? You just get a sort of a degenerated version of the original animal. You just sort of get a generated version of the original animal? Can you please explain what that means? And so when we see how dogs reproduce, we find, lo and behold, they reproduce dogs. How about that? Which is exactly what evolution tells us to expect. And you can get lots of different varieties of dogs, to be sure, because of the way that God has encoded the information in their genome. But wait, you said poodles were a mistake and not in the original genome. Does that mean they aren't part of the dog kind? And when we, when we, see, when we do this kind of stuff, when we do this kind of observation and experimentation, this is observational science. Whoa, are you about to pull a ham? This is the kind of stuff we can test and repeat in the present. And you know what? It confirms biblical creation. It's exactly what we'd expect, given that God made the organisms after their kind. Okay, I'm glad to see you didn't pull a ham on us. But as far as I know, creationists have yet to demonstrate a single way that biblical creation accurately predicts anything in the world. Also, please tell us what a kind is. Until you do, you can't really tell us that that's what we would expect to see from anything, let alone the Bible. It does not confirm this idea of unlimited upward evolutionary progress, where new instructions, brand new instructions, are added to the genome of an organism. Did you just merge several straw men together to make some sort of uh, mega straw man? Evolution has limits on what it can do, and it does not move in a set direction. And new instructions get added to the genome all the time. Now, I do need to point out that mutations can be beneficial yeah, there are some mutations that can actually, under certain circumstances, can help an organism to survive. Yes, evolution calls these beneficial mutations. But they're still loss mutations. They're st Not all beneficial mutations cause a loss in genetic information. They still lose information and therefore are still in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. Again, evolution does not have a set direction in which organisms must go. A loss a gain, or even just a change in the genome is evolution. You can imagine an island where it's very windy and the insects, as they're blowing, you know, they're flying around this little island, they tend to be blown off into the ocean and they die. Then imagine that there's a mutation that causes the wings not to form properly. So the insects can't fly. They're landbound, and therefore they can't be, or they're less likely to be blown off into the ocean and die, and so they're more likely to survive. Yes, and we call this natural selection, which is a mechanism by which evolution works. Also, because this mutation wasn't in the original gene pool, are they still the same kind, or has their kind changed? You continuously not defining what a kind is makes this point confusing. Because they've lost some instructions, and apparently there are islands where that's happened. Or a blind fish in caves, where there are some caves where it's dark all the time. And in that, in that circumstance, it's actually better to not have eyes. Because your eyes can get, you know, fish, when they bump into something, their eyes can get infected, and that could be a problem. And there are places in the world where there are caves that are totally dark all the time, and the fish don't have eyes. Because a mutation um, has occurred, and their eyes don't form properly, and it actually has an advantage in that particular environment. But it's still in the wrong direction, right? Wrong. 
Evolution has no set direction as previously stated, and your repetition of this assertion does not make it so. They've lost some instructions, and so it's the opposite of evolution. No, it's evolution. Or antibiotic resistance. You probably heard evolutionists say, well, here we go. Here's a great example of evolution. Bacteria becoming resistant to penicillin. That's a great example of evolution. Because the genome of bacteria in question has changed to allow them to survive a penicillin treatment. Because a mutation that would normally be benign or detrimental has instead become more beneficial for the bacteria to have. As a result, it's becoming more and more common as natural selection weeds out more and more of the bacteria without this mutation. But it's not evolution at all, because it's in the wrong direction. Continuing to repeat your straw man doesn't make it true. There are a few different ways that this can happen. I'm going to show you one of these. None of them are evolution, though. Uh, there's H. pylori, for example, which is a bacterium that causes stomach ulcers. And you can kill this thing by taking an antibiotic. The antibiotic goes in, it's absorbed into the bacterium, and he's got an enzyme in him that's part of his natural uh, makeup that when it interacts with that antibiotic, it will convert it into a poison. And then the poison kills the bacterium, and you feel better. There is a mutated form of H. pylori, which lacks that particular enzyme. He's got a gene damaged, and so he can't produce that enzyme, at least not in very high quantities. And so when the antibiotic goes into him, it just sits there because he lacks the ability to convert it into the poison. This sounds a lot like evolution to me. And so he's able to survive, but he survives because of less information. He survives because of a downward trend. More of the directional evolution, straw man. It's just in that unusual environment, it happened to benefit him. Yes, when its environment changed, its mutation allowed it to survive that change. And so what happens is then you kill off all the ordinary bacteria, and the only ones that survive are the mutated ones, they reproduce and you end up with a, a resistant strain of bacteria. Yes, this is what we generally call evolution. That's something that hospitals are concerned about because they tend to kill off all the ordinary bacteria with their antibiotics. But of course, the resistant strain, by the way, it's not, it's not improved, it's not a new and improved bacteria. It survived when all of its siblings died. That sounds like an improvement to me. It's just under that specific circumstance, it was better able to survive. Yes, it was able to survive in a situation where all others died. If that's not the definition of an improvement, then I don't know what is. But in the wild, they don't compete as well with the healthy, with the ordinary bacteria. Well, in the wild, all their competition was just killed off by an antibiotic treatment. And generally, things that are still alive tend to do better than things that have died. Because they are missing some instructions. It doesn't kill them, but uh, they're not able to do quite as well. Not quite as well as what? A corpse? Remember that treatment that just killed off all of its competition? How it performed before that point is irrelevant. What matters is it no longer has to share any of its resources. So that's an example of a beneficial mutation, but it's still the opposite of evolution because- No it's not. It fits the very definition of evolution, and your continuous assertion otherwise is not made more true by your repetition of them. They haven't gained any new instructions, they've lost information. It's in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. Repetition does not make that true. Dr. Lee Spettner is a PhD uh, biophysicist from Johns Hopkins University. says all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. First of all, Dr. Lee Spettner has a PhD in physics, not biophysics, which he got at MIT, not John Hopkins University. But he has worked at John Hopkins University, where he taught such courses as classical mechanics, electromagnetic theory, real variable theory, probability theory, and statistical communication theory. You'll notice not one of these is biology, which is because Dr. Spetner is not an authority in biology. Furthermore, his book only addresses and talks about a straw man that he created of evolution, so anything he might say about biology or evolution in his book is completely irrelevant to the discussion at hand. Isn't that interesting? He goes on to say that not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. He's clearly never heard of Down syndrome. And you, and you say, well, what if they find some, you know, what if they find one someday? But you see, that doesn't, that's not really going to help because there ought to be thousands of them. There are thousands of them. Probably more. In the evolutionary view, we're made up of these information-increasing mutations. And so they ought to be everywhere. They are everywhere. Your refusal to accept that doesn't change it. 
and according to him we find not even one. And we have already shown that not only is he not an expert, but he is only talking about a straw man. So anything he says is irrelevant to the conversation. So if somebody finds one, it's not a big deal. There ought to be thousands. If evolution were true, there should be thousands. There are. And it is. People say, well, what if a section of DNA gets duplicated? That can happen. There are mutations, duplications, where a section gets copied and repeated. Do you have any new information? Yes, that is new information. And while it might not do anything meaningful itself, it can act as a platform for further mutations to act upon. If a paragraph in a newspaper gets duplicated accidentally, could you learn anything from the second paragraph that you couldn't learn from the original? Those two things aren't even remotely similar. And even if you might not get information out of a duplication, that doesn't mean that a cell might not. There's no new instructions, right? There's no new information there. It's just longer. Wait a minute. Is your argument actually so weak that you have to lie about the evidence in order to defeat the straw man you created earlier? An increase in the length of the genome is an increase in genetic information. But there's no new information. And the same thing can happen in DNA. Apparently there's no process by which you can get brand new information in the DNA. You just gave an example of a mutation that does exactly that. And you're repeating that you don't get new information by making it longer doesn't make your assertion true. And so you see when we take a look at genetics and we study things like mutations and and the information content. This is good observational science. It's stuff that we can look at in the present, testable, repeatable today. I gave you credit before when you didn't go ham on us, but are you about to do that right now instead? We find that it confirms what we would expect given what the Bible teaches. To my knowledge, there has yet to be even one thing that the Bible has said that has been confirmed by science. So, citation needed. It does not confirm millions of years of evolution, where you'd, where you'd expect an accumulation of brand new information. Actually, a number of different science disciplines support evolution in a variety of ways, and, and evidence points to there being an accumulation of brand new information. And I think we'll end part two here.